Welcome everybody to the second installment of my top 100 games of all time countdown. Today we're going to be going over numbers 80 through 61. Slightly better games than last time. As I said, they're all good games, but these are just more good. Although I suspect... In other words, better. <laughs> better, yes. That's a English. synonym for more good. I suspect there's going to be some controversy on this list. I think this one may be the most controversial of all of them. Ooh. Well, let me let, so, let me double check. I looked over your 81 to 100. I wasn't here for that talk. And I, I thought it was pretty pretty much what I expected. I did, it was not controversial, so that's nice. Yeah, I, I kind of would have liked to see Exceed a little higher. I think that's the only... Oh, In Descent is a bad game and should not be on any list. You had a blast playing Descent. I did, but it had nothing to do with the game. It had a lot to do with the game. I would disagree there. We talked about that, though. Did you listen You listen to the list? Yeah, no, you guys had a great... Yeah. I think Orion... I forget what you said, but go back and listen to what Orion said. It was good. Clearly, what I said was... Less memorable? More good. <laughs> <laughs> okay, actually, looking back over the list, it's this one's not going to be particularly... Contra- well, I mean... What? Generally, I think you all are going to kind of agree or haven't played the games. I'm trying to breed controversy where there probably isn't much, but we'll see. So, as I explained last time, this is my top 100 games that I've played. I haven't played that many games compared to some of the larger reviewers. It's not in the thousands, it's in the hundreds. But all of these are very good games, and I would definitely recommend them. How I did it is that I took my list of games where I've recorded all my ratings and then used Pub Meeple's sorting tool, basically, where they you put in a list of games and it gives you a bunch of head-to-head matchups and you keep selecting which game is better until it gives you a, a list. I used that within each rating. So everything that got an 8 out of 10 on my my ratings, I, I did that sorting algorithm to, to sort them within the rating. Your base ratings are on a half point scale, right? Yeah, half point. So, so seven and a half, eight, eight and a half, and so on. Exactly. So that's how I did it. And let's just start with the first one. Number 80 is Command and Colors Ancients, a GMT version of Richard Borg's Command and Colors system, of which there are like five or six different games right now. And this is a fun one. It's a block war game. It is a an absolute disaster to sticker. I feel so sorry for you, Orion, that you had to sticker that. The initial setup is quite intensive and involves putting hundreds of stickers on many, many blocks. Many, many blocks. But it's a fun game of, was it Roman era? Yeah, Roman, Rome versus Carthage Rome is versus the setting Carthage. for the base game. The Punic Wars. Yes, and it does a it does a very good job kind of presenting a very simple battle system where if you're not familiar with the command and color system uses a hand of cards for each player which dictates what kind of troops they can move or on what location of the battlefield they can activate troops so it simulates a bit of command logistic problems just through the fact that you have to choose exactly one card per turn and maybe you only get to move uh, your unit's on the l- the rightmost third of the battlefield, and you can't touch the other two. But it's fairly simple in its kind of dice outcomes, and I think a good introductory block war game. Yeah, it's probably uh, somewhere between Psychikahara and Memoir 44. Yeah, Memoir 44 being another one in Borg's system. But yeah, kind of in the middle there in terms of complexity. Is there an element of hiding... Your, what's on your blocks in this game? I know some block word games have that. No, it does not have that. So everyone knows what units are out there. The big thing with Command and Colors Ancients is that you're trying to maintain the integrity of your lines. So if you have a line of infantry, you get significantly weaker if that's broken, or rather you get significantly stronger if the line is intact. There are a lot of cards that deal with that. So that's the main focus in Ancients, at least the base game. There are like nine expansions or something like that. Yeah, I think I remember we were at maybe a Netrunner tournament at some game store, and they had a whole shelf of these Commanding Colors games, which was cool to see all the different colors. Yeah, and then they have the Napoleonics one, which I haven't played, but Ancients is really good. And that's my number 80. So maybe you buy a very lightly used copy of the game so as to avoid the initial setup. 
Oh, that's smart. Pro that's tip. smart. Get someone else to do it for you. Number 79 is a game I do not have here with me. I think it's back at Matt's house. He, he has the copy of it. And it is a trivia game, Wits and Wagers, which for a long time I've been wanting to play. And I got to play it within the last few months a few times. And it's always been touted as kind of the the trivia game for board game people. And I think that's fairly accurate because it's kind it, it is a trivia game, but it's more of like a betting game. Because to get points or money or whatever the currency is in the game, to get points, you have to successfully determine who has given the correct answer, at least the answer that's closest to being correct. So all the answers are going to be numerical, and you all answer in secret on a little whiteboard, and then you lay out all of the different answers and you're trying to pick the answer that is closest to being correct without going over. It's a blast. I think it's a lot of fun in, in a party setting, kind of. It's really, you know... It's truly a party game. Yeah, really kind of creates a party, even if there wasn't one necessarily. You can't just kind of sit there and play it passively. There's a Because no one, almost always, like 99% of the time, no one there knows the actual answer. Yeah, I'd say it's a party game in both the good, in the best sense and some of the negative senses of that. In At least I am not good enough in at trivia to even feel like I had, I've ever had a strategy on betting on other people. I, I mean, the trivia is fun. It really is fun. It's, you know, whatever the questions are, they're, they're, they're enjoyable to do. But at any time that I've won it, it's felt like complete luck. But that's okay, because it, it really is a party, a party trivia game. Well, yeah, and I don't think it's complete. I, I really enjoy the process of trying to yeah. make an educated okay, guess. Okay, you're right. That, that process, the educated guess process, yeah, is great. And then I think there's a great moment in the game where once you see, like, maybe you, you've thought about it and you think you have a good guess, and then all of a sudden all the other answers are revealed, and they're so radically different from yours, and you start to question everything you thought in the last minute. Because you're like, what do they know that I don't know? Or maybe I'm the only one who's correct. And you have to kind of reevaluate everything based on all of the other responses. And I think that's that's just really, really fun. It plays way faster than Terra, which is maybe the most similar trivia game that we've we've played. It's got a similar concept in that you want to be close. Or you get rewarded for being close and not just having the correct answer. But I think Wits and Wagers does it a lot better. I think it's a it's a great game. As with any party game, it kind of lives and dies on the party of people playing the game. And if you have a really boring group of people, it's not going to be as much fun. It worked for us. Yeah. Well, maybe we're not as boring as other people. Who knows? <laughs> I, I think one of the things I like about this game, and maybe just party games in general, is that they're very accessible. Uh, this is a game that I would feel very comfortable playing with my parents who are not huge board gamers um they've played like ticket to ride but they don't get much much further down that path than that this is a game that i i would not hesitate at all to to teach them and i think we would all enjoy it yeah yeah it's definitely good in that context that's number 79 wits and wagers we've got a couple more people watching our live stream you may notice that our table is suffering from an affliction that i think haunts many board gamers nowadays and i'm going to call it Gloomhaven table <laughs> where you set up Gloomhaven and then it never gets put away. But I mean, that, that just makes it easier to play more Gloomhaven. It's so that's wonderful never a bad affliction. thing. Yeah, yeah. It's not so much an affliction as a condition. <laughs> so that's what the mess is on the table. You may be forgiven for being repulsed at the sight of Matt's naked face. He recently shaved. It's It's very bad. But for those who are listening to the podcast, it's know that it's very itchy. The wind in my the wind on my chin is great, but I don't know if it's worth it with just the itchy. I could have told you it's not worth it. But anyway, for those who are listening on the podcast, know that we are live recording these for the world, and right now the world's like three people. So you know, follow me on it's social well. media so you know when these things are going to be recorded. I think it's a great time interacting with everyone as they watch. Without further ado, let's move on to number 78. Archipelago, a game of going to a tropical archipelago. 
uh, gathering resources and then bickering endlessly with everyone else at the table about how you don't have to pay your resources because you already paid your fair share in that last thing that happened. Looking at you, Amber. Yeah, Amber's not here. She, she's gotten very angry during this game over questions of fairness and equity in trying to solve the problems of the archipelago. It's really game theory in a box, and I think it is highly flawed and highly enjoyable. Like, the 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 ratio between the amount of glaring flaws I see in the game and the amount of enjoyment I get out of it is probably the highest of any game that's going to be listed. Because I have a blast, there's, but I there's, wish it was better. <laughs> there's no way I would describe this game like that. <laughs> really? Yeah, I, I was curious. Uh, Orion and Ben, would this be as high as, as 78 on your lists? I, it's hard to hard to answer how high it would be. I don't think of it as de- as deeply flawed as Mark seems to suggest. I also enjoy it less because the conflict and the like tension and struggle back and forth is much more emotionally draining for me, I think, than maybe Amber who really revels in it. But I I think it's a good game. Um the mechanics I don't know how high are I fairly it. Euro like other than you're you're other constantly negotiating having... around these communal right tools that you have to put pay would it be safe to be would it be safe to say that this is the opposite game from spirit island kinda multiple islands instead of just one it, not working that's together. not the point <laughs> but the point is you're not working together and you're the invaders on the island it's true it's true yeah no it's a fair point so it's 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 this weird semi-cooperative thing where everyone's trying to get the most points and get the best resource engine and all that but very very frequently communal problems spring up and i just adore that idea because it's so prevalent in the real world when you have kind of communal economic systems but you don't see it in 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 board games at all except really for this game i think and i i think it's it's brilliant i mean the mistborn tries to do something similar right yeah, the the Mistborn game, which I recently re- reviewed, tries to do something similar. I don't think it's as successful near, at all. And I, it has to it has to be mentioned that this might have my favorite art of any oh, yeah. game. It's, it's gorgeous. It looks so good. The vivid blues and greens, the kind of tropical colors, are are just so good. The There's volcano, like little the Easter beach eggs. whales, like skeleton. Yeah, you just want to stare at the landscape pieces. All and the little huts and the fields. And, yeah, it's Yeah, great. see everything in there. It's really, really a great game. Even though I think there has some issues, I think it overcomes I those issues. I think this has a limited audience. I think this is for people who can dig into Euros, but also want maybe a game that has more of that social negotiation dynamic. Well, I think it's for people who, re- who like heavy Euros and want a really weird game. Like, you don't okay. just want something that's like every other heavy euro, and that's kind of me. So, I like it. I really like this game. I wouldn't say that it's one of my favorites, but it's. I, I really do enjoy any game that has that social manipulation and uh, negotiation as, as a part of the game. I think this one is probably more frustrating than most of the other games that I've played that have that negotiation because. Like the the consequences are real, and if 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 someone is w- unwilling to negotiate, you all go down in flames instead of it just being a, a lesser consequence uh, that would just hurt you. So I I do like that even if even if none of you are trying to actively tank the archipelago, it can still happen if someone's being stubborn. Yeah, yeah, that part of it's really cool. Number seventy seven is a game that we do not own, but we got to play recently at PAX East, and that is Dice Forge, which is a Engine building game, really, really simple. Way more simple than I thought in that the the kind of play board area would indicate. Game about manipulating the dice. And by manipulating, I mean physically taking off the faces of the, your, the dice that you have and adding new faces to the dice. So you're, you're molding the dice as you go, and it creates this kind of engine of sorts to gather resources and turn those resources into points. I thought it was an exceedingly pleasant game. On the simpler side... Um, yeah, it was simpler than I expected it to be. But really fun. Just yeah, kind really of the, the cadence that you would expect from an engine-building game with a lot of colorful artwork and cool dice 
it was customization. Overall, it, it was lighter than I expected. Yeah, yeah. But building dice, it's just a cool concept, and it executed it perfectly. I liked it. was just this lovely positive feedback loop of, like, you roll dice every every turn. Everyone rolls their dice and gets resources. And then you buy better dice, and then you get more resources, and then you buy victory points. Yeah. And you just keep going. Yeah, yeah exactly. You get You roll dice to get currency, and then you buy things that help you get more currency, and then you eventually turn that into victory points through a couple of different general strategies like there's nothing exciting super exciting in the mechanisms but the presentation so cool the idea of physically changing the physically dice changing the, yeah. the dice is so cool it's, and it was executed well it like, was executed well i felt like the the power curve kind of how you ramp up did well it, it was shorter than i thought it'd be but that it was pleasant yeah, which was good. I think it, it works well at the length that it has. The theme was kind of generic-ish, but just well executed. That's... I think it's in the same fictional world as his other games, which started in seasons, and then there was ah. a there was a pick up and deliver game in between them. So I think he operates within the same colorful fictional world which honestly generates some really awesome looking artwork yeah it looks really sweet yeah so that's number 77 dice forge number 76 is a game i got to play a few months ago and it was another kind of 45 minute game that ended up being an absolute blast and that is capital which i don't think any of you guys got to play the artwork is the opposite of Dice Forge and Archipelago in that it is very dour and kind of Eastern block looking because it's a Polish game about the city of Warsaw and all of its trials and tribulations trying to remain a functioning city throughout many wars. That said, it's a really fun tile laying game, drafting game, where you're drafting these square tiles, trying to fashion them into a grid that generates points and trying desperately not to run out of money and avoid the horrors of World War II, because that's a thing that happens during the game. It may look kind of dull, but honestly, the drafting was super fun. I love drafting anyways, and this one was really, really tight, where you had to make a lot of extremely difficult decisions about how to spend the money that you had, and how to hate draft a little bit to try to block your neighbor. It was very important to keep an eye on that and just trying to squeeze out every bit of benefit from each dollar you had or whatever the currency was. So that's capital. I think if we end up getting this game, which I would consider if I saw it cheap, I think you guys would really like it. Yeah, I think I saw like the setup of this game and it looked interesting, but it was, I hadn't eaten all day and I had to go or something like that. And then you guys ended up playing late maybe or something. I, I forget, but. I think you had to work or do some kind oh. of emergency work back in the yeah. hotel room. And then I got, I was going to like stay up late and write a review. And they're like, no, no, come play this game with us. I'm like, okay, I'll come play the game. <laughs> it ended up being really fun. I'm going to keep my eyes open for this one. That's capital. Number 76. Number 75 I've got right here in a. Speaking of, like, bright, amazing artwork in a very large box, and that is Millennium Blades. This is this game is one of the most overproduced games that I, I've ever seen because the currency, instead of giving you tokens or little chits or even, like, you know, p paper money like Monopoly or something, they had extra budget, and so they made a actual bundle of bills. So you'll have, like... 10 pieces of paper wrapped together in a bundle and that will be one dollar and then you'll have a different color bundle and that will be five dollars and then you'll have it, another bundle for ten dollars <laughs> the the components and artwork on this game are so over the top and i was looking at a, a level 99 uh kickstarter recently i think all of their games are just w way overproduced like but to the point where it becomes good again right yeah, I mean, the artwork is always really inspired by a, a lot of the times video games. In this case, it's games like the Yu-Gi-Oh card game. But like they have a game based on the artwork of like pixel, like 16-bit pixel video games. 
and then Exceed, which we've talked about in the podcast recently, has the art of like the Street Fighter video games. Level 99 always gets this very, very distinctive style and setting with their games, which I find super fun. But yeah, the bundles of bills kind of epitomizes everything about this game in that there's just a lot of it. And I think maybe not intended, but kind of a funny dig at the theme because, you know, you you associate like stacks of cash with like drug deals and the game is about being a collectible card game player, which to some people can be very similar to being ad- addicted to drugs. So maybe there was an intentional connection there on some slight social commentary, but it is indeed a game about being the player of a different game, which delights me completely. It's real time partially in that there'll be, there are three different segments where you're actively buying new booster packs and trying to construct decks and swapping cards with other players and selling cards on the aftermarket and buying cards. And then at three different points in the game, in between the real time steps, you all get together and have a tournament. And I think honestly, the the game, I kept hearing about the game in terms of the real time segment with all of that buying and selling being the kind of the key excitement of the game but i think the actual tournament and the little game you play there might be the best part of it i think it's actually a very very clever little card game system and without it the rest of the game would would fall apart i was um i came to this game after you guys and i i was surprised how good that card game actually was i thought it was all going to be about the meta game of collecting the cards but one thing I noticed is like there are different legitimate strategies to this little card game. And I forget what I did, but just like a real CCG. Yeah, it hits all the points of like trying to work, play around other people's strategies and kind of a risk reward thing and pushing your luck all within this little tournament game. And then even though it has cards that are like the meta, which determine point structures a little bit for your decks, the most exciting part of the game is that you create within this two-hour game your own little meta game as you go from tournament to tournament because you know what kind of deck your opponents had in the previous tournament and they know what you had and so if their deck really counted yours you might want to kind of start from scratch and try a new different strategy but then they may be through the trading and stuff noticing that you're doing that and pivot accordingly and that I think is the real fun of the game is in doing that meta and having it play out in the tournaments. The and, that game... pa- and that part of the game happens in real time. Although the one time I've played, we were never really constrained by that. It just forced us to not spend forever swapping cards. Yeah, it's not a really hectic real time thing in my experience. It's not like you're constantly fighting against the clock. It's just kind of like, okay, guys, time to wrap up what you're doing right now and get on with the game, which is a different way of doing things with real-time games, and I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing. It's also crazy excessive, again, in a good way, in just the number of cards in this game. Like, when you set up the game, you're supposed to shuffle a stack of cards that's like six inches tall. It's truly absurd, but you're never gonna feel like there aren't enough cards in Millennium Blades. It's just cards and cards and cards in a really unique and fun game. Next on the list at number 74 is Libertalia, one of the first games I played, I think, when I moved back here to Boston. we, you, If you've heard uh, Bubba on the previous podcast, he has a copy of this, and I remember in my first year here, I think we went over for a game day at his house and we played this game, and I really, really enjoyed it, and I played it a few times since, or a couple times since in person and, and quite a few times online over the past few years, and I guess the theme so far of this this list, this countdown at least, this segment is really unique games because I think Libertalia, I've never seen anything else like it before or after. It's a pirate-themed kind of bluffing game where you're trying to, during a, each turn, everyone plays a card face down and then you flip them all up and resolve them in order. And they all have various abilities and you're trying to kind of gain, get the best loot through a variety of ways to 
kind of get in position to grab the best loot. But the key to the game is that everyone has exactly the same cards. So when you're looking at your hand of cards at the beginning of the game, you know all the possibilities of what everyone else is going to play. And that creates such a cool like poker-like dynamic of trying to bluff and double bluff and counter bluff and trying to outwit everyone. And then a higher player counts, it just can become complete chaos. The the play <laughs> no. part of Libertalia is reminds me a little bit of Le Grande or El, El Grande? El Grande. El Grande, where the, you, you, ha, you all have the same hand and you're all playing these cards that determine your initiative and you have to choose when to play a certain card because you only have one of them, of course. Although in Libertalia, I think you all reveal simultaneously. Yes. So it's it's more of a bluffing game instead of an initiative game. I think I've played this game once and it was fun, but Bubba smoked us by doubling everyone's score. Or, I don't know, 80 to 60 or to 50 does. or something. You know, it was... It's a common occurrence with him. Common occurrence. I just remember playing and it was kind of fun, but I don't really have a desire to play it again. That was my memory. I think you guys... Maybe not Matt. I don't think Matt likes simultaneous reveal games at all that's not true what's the we played one recently that i loved really what was it what did we play i didn't recently? name it because i don't remember <laughs> exceed <laughs> yeah that's the only one recently because you can have your plans completely blow up in your face yeah, and i right. think that's that's what I, I i don't enjoy as much and it, it that's more a matter of taste i think so yeah to me the 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 core of the game is just figuring out all the possibilities of interaction that could happen given what you know everyone else has in hand. And I think it's really the knowledge, the fact that you have the knowledge of every card that everyone has is so important to the game because yes, you do have this kind of randomness where you don't really know what they're going to play, but you can make an educated guess at what they're going to play or you can you can make more or less risky plays because you do have a lot of knowledge and that's just a blast number 73 continuing on weird and interesting games although this one is not as weird now that there have been many or i shouldn't say many quite a few games in the last couple of years kind of spun off of its concept but it is sherlock holmes consulting detective a game where you're given a map of london literally a like a phone book or directory of the people in the city and kind of a little few paragraph prompt into a Sherlock Holmes style mystery. And then you just kind of open the map and, and pick the where to newspaper. go. Oh yes. The and most, the newspaper. The most important part. Yeah. Newspaper's key. Newspaper is really, really difficult to figure out what's significant in that thing. I just love it. I love it. Like you normally hand it to one player and they're just like, Gonna drink some coffee and they just literally read the, read the newspaper. Yeah, yeah. The, what other game can you but then, say? Like, but then, okay, like, here, just chill with the newspaper and read through it for a while. And yeah, tell but me. what happens is, is other people are making the decisions, and then like the person reading the newspaper overhears a word. It was like, oh wait a minute, I read about this in in the letters to the editor. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's so cool and you're really there's not a lot of structure to the game you kind of just go to each location and then you have a little book that tells you if anything significant happens at that location and you have to piece together the solution the, the details and the and who f did the murder or the crime or whatever and it's just a fun time especially just kind of chilling we used to meet up for a few Sundays in a row or a couple Sundays in a row we we met up after church and just Hung out in the afternoon playing this game and solving one Reading of the mysteries. Reading the newspaper and walking around the map of London in the 1800s and uh, just solving mysteries. Yeah, I will say there are some very notable typos and misprints and the font in this game is atrocious. Like, do not play this game in a low light situation. You need some nice high quality lighting to be able to read the script in that thing. Some high quality gas lighting. <laughs> For the mood, I suppose. Yeah. The puzzles are, are great. They're Sherlock Holmes puzzles through yeah, and through. Yeah, so you, you have a directory and you have a you, you come up you come across a scene initially and then you just start walking around London knocking on different doors trying to find clues and piece together what happened. And then once you think you've solved the crime, 
Sherlock comes in and is like, oh, you took 16 stops to solve this. I knew the answer in two or something. Yeah, yeah. Then you get scored based on that. But it's really less about the score and more about trying to solve something together. What what I like about how open it is or how free form it is, is that you end up kind of creating little narratives with your group. The certain path you took to get to the answer, the person who pulled out the one critical piece of information or the person who always thought it was this one person in the newspaper, but it never was. <laughs> oh gosh, that happened to us, right? Yeah, and then like, three months like those, later, it was that person. <laughs> the one, yes, the one time I, I didn't pay attention to Johnny in the newspaper. Johnny was actually the jewel thief. But I, you end up creating these little narratives that, that fit into the, the free form nature of the, the mystery, which I think are really, maybe, maybe the what's unique about it. Yeah, and I think what's so cool about it is that it does not insult your intelligence at all. Like, it may go too far at that and make some associations that are a little... Like, yeah, okay, that was a that was a stretch that we could have figured that out. But it's not like it's not like, you know, those computer games where you're just kind of hunting around for the one the one thing you need to know, and then it's like, yes, that was related to what you needed to know, and here's the answer. The no, this is really like it feels like a thing happened, and then you have to make actual detective work and actual problem solving and none of it feels contrived yeah you actually have the opportunity to be clever and to solve a mystery so and that's wonderful other than the the aforementioned typos the writing is really good too you show up to like a theater and you talk to the manager and it's all very very pleasant very pleasantly written the only reason i haven't bought the other ones i think there's a sequel now and then like a lovecraftian one and then maybe a couple others and the only reason I haven't gotten those is because we haven't finished all the mysteries in this one. But I would love to get together again and, and finish all of these because I think it's it's just a blast. All right, moving on to number 72. This one is a very large box, and it is Star Wars Rebellion. You're just doubling down on being wrong. You're what? like, I was wrong last year. How can I be more wrong this year? Let's move Rebellion down 30 spots. You're just doing this to get a reaction, and you've succeeded. No, I'm not. This is legitimately where I would rate it. I think it's a great game. I don't think it's like top 15 like you all do. I wouldn't There's put a it long top distance 15. between 72 and yeah. top 15. This is easily in my top 30. And that's not counting the fact that I love the theme so much that I would, you know, effectively put it higher than that. I love Star Wars as much as any of you all. Clearly not. Clearly not. <laughs> Clearly not. And this was the controversy that I predicted at the beginning. But I think Rebellion's a great game. It's just not as great as many other games. It's a two-player asymmetric game where one side is the Imperials, one side's the Rebellion, and it's kind of a giant game of hide-and-seek where the Rebellion's trying to hide on a particular planet, hide their base, you know, the plot of the first uh, movie chronologically. And the Empire's kind of expanding their net of f fleets and trying to hunt them down and figure out where they are and destroy them. And there's a lot of little clever mechanisms. I think the timing thing is the coolest part of the game, where you're counting the number of turns the game is taking, but as the Rebellion accomplishes secret objectives, it decreases the total number of turns that need to happen before they win so it's it's like a candle burning at two ends and once they meet up the rebellion wins so they kind of accelerate the clock of the empire and that's really cool the missions are the probably the best part of the game yeah there's there's these hands of mission cards that you're playing and assigning. but the, the whole like assignment and face down assignment and then having to go back and forth and yeah yeah that's really cool that's really what elevates it for me is you have this whole kind of cat and mouse of like you want to get things done so you want to assign leaders to missions but at the same time you're going back and forth so you're watching the other player assign things to missions or not and you're like what are they saving their guys for why hasn't emperor palpatine gone on a mission yet i better <laughs> hold all my guys back 
Yeah, because you have these leaders and those are kind of your actions for the round. But you to do certain actions like moving a fleet, you need to not assign some of those people to mission cards. And you're trying to outthink and outguess what your opponent is doing, which really requires a knowledge of the cards. The first couple of games, it's a lot of kind of semi-blind guessing, I think, on in that regard. But that's a cool part of the game. The miniatures are awesome. I think it's not rated higher just because I think the balance of the game is very fragile and I don't feel as much Star Wars in it as I do its kind of sister game, which will be higher on the list. Well, I guess sister games in that there will be other Star Wars games higher on the list and then another game from a different IP that's kind of similar to this one also. People who know board games are going to understand what I'm saying here. But they're all glaring at me, so I'm going to move on. I do like Rebellion, guys. I really do. I don't believe you. It's in my top 100. You've only just... played like 130 games. That's not true. <laughs> That's not true at all. It won't even make an appearance next year. I mean, maybe. We'll see. I just like 70-something games better than it. So just think as I reveal each successive game that I like it better than Rebellion. I've already considered that. and I've, it, I've already decided I mean, that the next like incorrect. 30 games are worse than Rebellion without knowing what they are. <laughs> oh, you guys are fun. All right, from here on out, I will tell you how far below Rebellion each game should be. Oh, you're going to have fun with this next one then. Number 71 is from our favorite designer, Vlada Kavadal, and it is Dungeon Lords. Matt's I like Dungeon least, Lords. Matt's just, least game favorite just game. just not better than Rebellion. I just don't like Dungeon Lords. I don't know. I can't I I can't judge Dungeon Lords cuz I hate the action bidding. It's not bidding, it's game. simultaneous reveal. No, there there's a dynamic where you you reveal and then depending on the order of where you reveal, you may not get to do the thing you wanted to do. Yeah, correct. Correct. And that's the worst. Be, and, it, and it's exacerbated because it's not just like you trying to outwit the one person you're playing against. If you're playing with more than two people, it becomes chaotic very quickly, in my opinion, to the point where you're not going to be able to do what you want, but it's it wasn't in anyone's control. It was just chaos. No, it's I, I, I highly that. disagree with that. I think the game, it's a push your luck thing because you generally know what other people will want to be doing that turn. You, you also, also know, know a couple... You also know what they did last turn, yeah, and those it, cards aren't available it's, for it's, them. It's fundamentally different than, like, an Agricola, where you might take the, take well, I'm not the action before it. someone else does. It ends up being chaotic, because it's like... It's, yeah. it's chaotic, but highly controlled, because you have a lot of information to make your guess, and like Libertalia, kind of outwit and out guess other people and maybe you like it's not a situation where you're not going to be able to do your action a lot of the time unless you're taking huge risks like maybe two to three actions out of the entire game at most that you attempt to do you won't be able to do and if you really want to do something you can usually get it in there by placing it in the in that top priority hole of the yeah yeah well, let me explain how this works for people who haven't played. It's a worker placement game, but you secretly select which parts of the board you're going to and in what order, and then everyone reveals that at the same time and you follow that order, and there are only a certain number of slots for each of the places on the board. So maybe there are only three slots for a certain place, and if everyone selects that action that round, the, yeah, the last person... In, in resolution order who selected it won't be able to go there but there's again a lot of mitigation there the cool thing though is that you can then also push your luck because each of the different tiers or spots on each of the action tracks has a different cost by a little bit or maybe a different benefit or it gets it gets tweaked in some little way so you generally know how much your actions are going to cost based on your guessing of when they're going to get resolved, but you might be surprised one way or the other. So you have to leave a little bit of safety room for kind of getting things done that you want to get done. And it's a really, really tight Euro game about this theme of 
being a dungeon lord who's creating this dungeon for explorers and adventurers to come in and try to conquer, and you're trying to get them to run away instead. And the artwork's super fun. The game's incredibly zany. It's surprisingly difficult. Like, ignoring the whole bluffing thing, like, even if you got your selection of what to do, it's moderately difficult to actually score a good number of points. And I think in our first game, we had one person score in positive points. No, that's not true. Everyone was positive. One person was in double digits. I thought I, one, I, thought I scored negative, negative points. Maybe w- you were the only one then. It was very tight, though. Technically, the game says if you get positive points, you win in the theme of getting your dungeon license. But you were really competing to get the most points and be the best dungeon lord. Right, yeah, it's that Vlada thing where he makes a very punishing game and then is like, you're all winners. A little bit. <laughs> a little bit. But some of you are more winners than <laughs> others. And that's delightful. There are, spoiler alert, going to be a healthy number of Vlada Cavado games above this on my list, but I think Matt's completely wrong. And No, I just don't <laughs> like the mechanic. I wouldn't go as far as to say that it's a bad mechanic, but consistently games that have that kind of chaotic bidding are, are games that I don't like. Yeah. Well, I mean, everyone has their taste, but oh, in, yeah, in yeah, the yeah, Vlada yeah. No, spirit, no, no. I, I'm not, some tastes are better than others. Let me be others. clear. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not criticizing your list here or, or this selection here. Other it's than not the my fact cup of that tea. it should be below Rebellion. <laughs> That's like incomprehensible that it'd be above ha- Rebellion. Having this game listed at 71 is fine, but having it having it listed above Rebellion is not, I think is what I'm hearing. Well, you're wrong. <laughs> I'm, I'm basting a verbal wit here. Next on the list at number 70 is a game, I, again, another game like Capital I got to play at a conference a few months ago, and it is a real-time competitive game that I need to get my hands on because I think you guys will find it hilarious. And that is Paramedics Clear. Have I told you about this game? I remember you telling me about this, but it was a while ago and it was very briefly. It's really, really fun. So it's a game about being an EMT, basically, or or in charge of an ambulance. And again, real time and app assisted, you're trying to kind of set collect a bit. Well, not really. You get a hand of cards and they have different colors on them and then you have to trade in different combinations of those colored cards to get different medical supplies ranging from a band-aid to like a blood pack so different things you know that you would need in an ambulance as the game progresses in real time you're getting new patients in your ambulance and you have to do something to help them in order to not have them die at the end of like your two minute round or like a minute and a half it's really short And so they'll have a list of medical items they need and you're trying to just put something on someone and then trying to use your cards as best you can to try to get the most supplies and you can store away some or you can put in sets to like get a rescue helicopter to like emergency pull someone off. But you're also manipulating the cards that your opponent gets in their ambulance. So whenever you fully heal someone, you draw two cards and then you choose one of them for yours. And if your opponent has an empty spot, you give them the other one. The whole thing is played in real time. So as soon as your turn ends, you hit the button on the app and the next person's turn begins. And then you have to do a lot of like clean up and organization and draw your new cards and kind of plan for your next turn. And before you know it, your turn's back on you again. And I'm a big fan of real time games. And this is one of the best I've played. It was... Super fun in a little little box, like a little card game and really, really tight mechanisms and felt consistently difficult every round. What does this most closely feel like of, of games that we played? I mean, is Space Alert? Yeah. The closest? It's that level of like panic. More than Space Team. The app, you mean? Yeah. Space Team is more about communication. It's like Space Alert but a bit less complex, but the same level of, I need to get this done and this done and this done, and oh no, time's about to run out. One of the coolest things is that you have to end your turn before the time runs out. Because if you let the time tick down to zero, you lose like all progress for that round. 
So some of the times I'm like, okay, I don't think I can do any more. I'll do this and this and this. And I passed it with like 30 seconds to spare, which could of course throw off the opponent's rhythm because they not might not be ready for that. But then sometimes you're trying to do as much as you can. It comes down to the wire and you hit it when it's like, you know, at half a second or something. <laughs> and that's really fun. It was just, it was done so well. And I, and I really, really enjoyed it. Sounds like a blast. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, it would be easier with more players because you have more time to kind of prepare for your next turn. With two players, it was really intense. You know, and it's like maybe with two players, it was like 20 minutes total maybe. But you're always doing something even during your opponent's turn. I, I got to get a copy of this someday just so we can do a proper review and play it. Because I, I it was a huge surprise to me. I was not expecting that when I sat down to play the game. Number 69 is a delightful game from designer and artist and producer Ryan Lockett, and that is Above and Below. Nice. <laughs> Grow up, Ben. <laughs> oh, boy. Ryan is known for his art, and obviously, if you just look at the game, it's incredible, but he's a very solid game designer also, and this is my favorite of the couple of games I've played of his... I think Near and Far, which is a newer game and kind of a similar system, is getting a lot of buzz. But I, I think I've settled on Above and Below actually being the better game, although it's not nearly as ambitious. It's a worker placement game where you are doing normal worker placement things. You're trying to get money to buy buildings that give you different resources and income. And you're gathering different objects and trying to build up points and income and all that normal euro stuff but then and th that's all true but then the it's really about going on explorations absolutely 100 percent agree yeah so you can go underground and explore the cavernous expanses below the land in which you're settling and there's a huge storybook where you get confronted with some kind of situation down there and you read a little snippet of story and you get a couple of options and then you have to roll some dice after you pick an option and see if you are brave or wise or strong enough to overcome the obstacle in front of you and gain some kind of reward. And that part is just, it's so fun. It's a little bit random because you can't really tell what kind of rewards you're going to get. And so it's not the most cutthroat or competitive worker placement or Euro game. But I think the better player is usually going to win. But despite whatever randomness there is, the stories themselves are just so fun and well-written and create a really cool narrative within, honestly, a really unique fantasy world. Like, it's so much more pleasant and happy than fantastical worlds we see all the time, and I love that. Not that there isn't some darkness, but it's always, yeah, in that fantastical, pleasant way. It's in the style of like some of the older science fiction you'll read where it's just about being amazed at the unknown and encountering new things. Whereas I feel like a lot of modern science fiction and fantasy is about the danger of new things and you know, contemplations on evil or things like that. And there's room for both, obviously, but this is firmly in the kind of wonderment style of fantasy, and that's just a delight. I think, in a word, we've described this as whimsical. Yes. It, and the art In a good way. Too. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, in a very it's good way. It's full of whimsy, and you I've, just have a great time playing. This game is so great because of i don't think it's because of like the, the gameplay i think it's because of the extras it's like the art is fantastic and the stories are fantastic and i think and there's like 200 of them yeah yeah it's 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 well, and I, i've got even more with the near and far kickstarter yeah. i got an extra storybook for above and below which is so i i we need to play this dive into that i i think it's a very good game uh just mechanically you know it's a light euro maybe what above and below does better than any other game is is kind of dull the sharpness of of euros does that make sense hmm. yeah because i've played this i've used this as sort of and i hate this word but a gateway game with a couple of people and it's precisely because even if you're severely losing you get to go on adventures and 
read stories. Like it's still fun. It's still fun in that way, even if you don't grasp any of the strategy at all. Yeah, you still have the the cool characters that are yours because because you went to the town and hired them. And going back to last week's podcast, this is definitely a wet or dank or moist game. <laughs> yes, definitely. Now that I think about it, we should have mentioned it in last week's podcast. Certainly, it's it's a great example of that. I've got another Ryan Lockett game that we just haven't gotten around to yet, and I'm hoping it's you know just as good as this one. Above and Below is my currently my preferred Lockett game. Number 68 is a two-player war game, the first hex encounter war game I have played, and that is Blood in the Fog from Holland Spiel. I was convinced to try this one out by the designer on Twitter when I mentioned that I'd never played a hex encounter game before, and this is one of his recommendations, and we had a great time playing it. It's about a war between... What is it, Russia and France? It's a battle in the Crimean War. Yes, that, in which there was a lot of fog. And one side is kind of on this hilltop, and the other side's trying to advance, and one of them is severely outnumbered. Yeah, it's the numerically superior Russians who have crap guns, but they have, in, I think in history it's like 35,000 to 8,000 or something. So yeah, they yeah. Significantly outnumber. And their primary tactic is bayonet charges. So they're just trying to charge up the hill and get into into the melee. And uh, the British have the techno- technologically superior guns, but with all the fog, they're unable to use them until later in the day. Yeah, so it has this fog mechanic, which is amazingly partially luck-based because you're pulling things from a bag to determine when the fog will start start subsiding but it also has the snowball mechanism where once it starts to subside it snowballs out so and it, the game goes faster yeah point. and the game moves more quickly so the russians are really trying to do as much damage as possible in the fog just kind of throwing themselves up this hill and then it, it's the it's the british and the french right the french come in as reinforcements yeah that's right yeah the british and the french who have these guns that can shoot at like range eight or something. But because of the fog at the beginning of the game, you can literally only shoot one hex away until it lifts. And it's really a dramatic system that works really, really well. And I, I'm liking this kind of sub genre. I haven't explored much, at least with this one example of kind of recreating specific battles. And I think it does a really good job of, through mechanisms in the game, creating this image for you of what the battle was actually like with the fog and the guns like breaking down because it was so wet and all that fun stuff. So I haven't played this. Uh, it's very asymmetric. Yes. In, in its display. So one side is basically trying to gain as much advantage as they can when melee is 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 better. And then and then the British are, are basically trying to wait it out until they can... And they also their, their, they also have guns. the high ground. They also have the high ground a and defensive defensive advantage. Yeah, they have like defensive structures. Actually, they're trying to hide behind. So they're trying to kind of get everything in position to hold off this assault. Yeah, they pretty much want to line the hilltop and hold off the Russians. Yeah, until but they but can... it's interesting because as like troops get shot and hit and stuff, you kind of want to cycle them back and cycle in fresh troops. So there's lots of fun logistical movement stuff with that. Yeah, a troop that's damaged is less effective. Right. I would need to play this more. Like, it's on my list to play more, and I think it's a really, really fun game. And surprisingly simple. I was always afraid of Hex Encounter games, because you hear Advanced Squad Leader in its 400-page rulebook. This has, like, an 8-page rulebook. It's it's actually quite simple, and if you can play, you know, a medium-weight Euro, you can absolutely learn how to play this one. It's probably simpler than Command and Colors. Similar in amount, like, the units that you're moving around, but I think it's a little simpler. Command and Colors is a lot of weird rules, like, there's a whole section on how elephants, like, go berserk and trample your units. And... I think there's a similar amount of, kind of, weirdness in this one with, like, the guns breaking down and the way you... Yeah, maybe. I, I, Some there, of the movement there are fewer rules. rules. There are fewer rules in this. Really? I think it's probably similar, is how I... It's close. I, yeah. Well, yeah, it's pretty close. It's pretty close, yeah. They're both, I would say, fairly light in terms of war games. In their like world, they're fairly light, yeah. Yeah, definitely. 
Number 67, again, a convention game I played a few months ago. I got to play with the famous Eric Summer uh, from the Dice Tower and his son, and it was a delight. I believe it was his son's favorite game, and it's called Crosstalk. Oh, yeah. Remember this oh, one, yeah, Ryan? Yeah, a fun one. This was really fun. It's kind of like code names in that you're trying to guess a word based on clues. but Limited clues. Very limited clues because there are two teams and there's two code givers and they know the word that they're trying to get their team to guess. But both teams are trying to guess the same word. And when you give a clue and you write it down on a board, the opposing team gets to guess next. <laughs> And that's the order that plays out. So you're I trying mean, to give clues that can help your team, but are vague enough that don't give it away to the other team. Matt looks confused. There's one more no, rule that's going to clarify this I'm game. I'm not confused. I'm, I'm wondering, is this all about knowing your teammates? Well, here, there's another thing. You first, though, give your team a secret clue that only they know. That helps. Which kind of is a key factor in the game. And you're just trying to give the vaguest, maybe helpful clues possible to get your team to guess it when their turn comes around. But as guessers, you can pass. You can keep passing because you don't want your guesses to give away what your secret clue might have been. So it's really tense kind of brinksmanship of waiting and waiting until you think you actually know the answer. There was another thing where you can give like a hint where it has like... You can write these diagrams yeah. and say like, this is a good clue, this clue connects to that clue, ignore this clue, or it's the opposite of this clue, things like that. So you have a one-time use of this hint board that you can give to your team and tell them kind of how to parse the different clues and which ones to pay attention to. Wait, and when does that happen? Anytime? Anytime. As is your turn, I think. After or what at the start of your or you turn, can do or it after like you give a clue or it might be after you give a clue or before you give a clue but I think you can only do it once yeah you get one we, one use of it we didn't use it most of the games and I think that might be the better version because you can really kind of give it away at that point I th I think it can be very very helpful to use the clue sheet oh yeah if but you, if you thought ahead you could use it to like give opposite clues for the first two or something. Right. And then later tell your team, ignore those and pay attention to this other thing. And the other team would not know, have that information. Yeah. And I should clarify, I said the what you're trying to guess are words. It doesn't, it's not like code names or has to be one word. Like one time, one it, it of ours. It could be a phrase or a something. It's yeah. a thing. It's a noun, basically. Like one of ours was the uh, the Pony Express yeah, we were trying to get. And that was a really fun. Are, tense there, are game. there limits on clues or like, like the secret crew? On There's the words like you can't rhyme and it has to be the meaning. I like the standard set of like word. Yeah, clue. I think they have to be single words like code names. The clues. Uh, maybe. Yeah. Maybe I don't remember. It was taught to us. It sounds really fun. What is the ideal player count? I, so, I think I, similar to code names. You know, you want, I, I, you at, want least, at least at least six. Yeah, at least six, but could go up theoretically indefinitely. Oh, it leads to some really hilarious situations like we had in one game where one of the clue givers didn't want to give anything away because she thought her team was just on the brink of guessing it. So she wrote the same word three times in a row with like a different suffix. But made it made it plural or made it like a, a, a past verb. tense yeah. or something like that. Yeah, it was like I, I don't think the word was male, but it was like male and then mailing. And then mailer, <laughs> yeah. and we we mocked her relentlessly. It was hilarious. <laughs> Were they not close to? They the didn't word? know what the word was. They had no idea. <laughs> no. So then, because not only were we mocking her, her own team was because like give us something. <laughs> it was really fun, and I think a solid game in that kind of code names this line. Like it has a twist, but it's a really clever twist on the system that I think creates a lot of interesting situations. The one negative I would say for the game that doesn't put it up there with code names, honestly, is that we found in most of the games the secret clues were nearly identical. Like some, the a lot is, of the prompts, the secret clues are going to be pretty obvious what you want to give. Yes, and the games were much better when we had different clues between the teams. Right. But I will say I think there's a strategy as a clue giver in trying to think of a less obvious clue to give your team. Maybe? I don't know. Maybe not. I don't Maybe. know. Maybe. I, I think 
Like one time, the last clue we had was bulletproof vest, or as the thing we we're trying to get them to guess, and we both gave police as the secret clue. But I think if you gave something more obscure like ceramic as your secret clue, then you can give police as a public clue. Oh no, it wasn't. Bu- it was specifically Kevlar vest, right? No, it was bulletproof. It was bulletproof. Vest, okay. And I wanted to give Kevlar, but I decided that was not valid because it was a proper noun or something. Yeah, yeah. So. I think, honestly, it has the potential. In certain games, it might... Let me put it this way. In kind of an ideal game of crosstalk, it's better than code names. But I think it's just less consistent. At least based on the few games we played. Like, it's really fun. I don't believe you. Sure. I don't know if... Maybe at its best, it's better than code names' worst. But I don't think it would be, on average, better than code names. No, I don't think on average. But I think, like, the best game we had of that was some of the best guessing game fun i've ever had or maybe i was just seduced by eric summer's legendary voice you, you guys don't opinions. even get that you don't watch the dice no. he's their voiceover guy he's a professional voiceover person he does audiobooks and stuff my other memory from this is that we were trying to guess merry-go-round was the thing and i had it and I wrote it on my board, but apparently my handwriting is so terrible that he literally couldn't <laughs> read what I had written. Yes. And so we just guessed carousel instead. Yes, I remember that. You wrote it on there. Because they give you like a board to like... You have a secret s- note board that you and your team can like write on. Guess to, on so you don't have to whisper. Yeah. And, stuff. and uh, yeah, none of us knew what you wrote. <laughs> I had the right answer. <laughs> All right, moving on. To number 66, the two-player abstract strategy game Onitama, which is like miniature chess. It's a five-by-five five board, and each player has five pawns, essentially, or four pawns and a master pawn. And you're trying to capture the opponent's master or get your master to the opposite side of the board. The twist in this game is that there are five movement cards at play. And they rotate through the players. So you have two in hand, one in the middle, and your opponent has two in hand. And when you play a card to do a certain movement type, you put the card you played or you used to make that move in the middle and you take the other one from the middle. And so all these movement cards are cycling throughout. And so you kind of have an idea of what moves your opponent can make, but you have to kind of think in your head of, okay, what am I going to pass him and then what might he use and pass to me? And then all the cards are yeah. public, so you can see all the. Yeah, you can it's not a see of everything. Remembering what they have, it's a matter of thinking ahead and saying, if I do this, then they can use it two turns from now. And how do I kind of box them in? Yeah, and I am finding it to be a really, really fun abstract game. It's casual enough to not give me a headache like chess might. But it has, I think, enough depth and planning ahead and strategy, kind of understanding how the cards are going to rotate through the players to be very, very interesting and genuinely kind of difficult to to plan ahead. But not that difficult. Like To me, it fits in kind of a niche of thinky but not exceptionally so with a strategy game that looks really cool, honestly. It's got this cool box and a rollout mat and all that good stuff. So I'm really enjoying Onitama. It's fun, but this might be the worst game we've talked about today, in my opinion. Wow, you really don't like it that much. This is your top 100 games, Mark, and they're all great. I'm (laughs) saying relative to the ones we've talked today, it's fun, but I don't like it as much. Okay, I thought you enjoyed it a lot. I've never played it, but I'd put it like 40 spots below Rebellion. (laughs) Oh, I think you would like it, Matt. I think you would. Number 65 is a game I've played a couple of times in the last month, and that is the new version of Martin Wallace's game, London, the second edition. It is a tableau building game about trying to do battle with evil poor people and reduce poverty in your city. You're ostensibly like building up London, and it's got this weird but cool system where you lay down the cards in your tableau, but you don't get any benefit from them until you run your city, which causes everything in your tableau to trigger. And then you take a bunch of poverty based on how many cards were in your city tableau. And then you have to find ways to reduce that poverty because it ends up being negative victory points. Unless you have the lowest amount of poverty at the end. 
And it's just a interesting cadence to kind of a system that you thought you knew, tableau building, that kind of puts a twist on it and makes it an interesting puzzle. Well, interesting cadence is good for two reasons. One, when you run your city, most of your city, like most of your cards flip over. Like most of the cards most are of them are one time use. use. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And then you literally build on top of them, which is cool. Yeah. It's it's as if you're doing London through centuries. Maybe the water treatment plant is where the old pub used to be or something. Right. Right. And then like we're used to these kind of, I don't know, resource management. I, I mean, it's resource management. Yeah, it's got Euro resource stuff. Poverty is probably the mo- the most important resource, but it's such a negative resource, which oh, is yeah. so un- unique. It fe- it's a downer of a game. It really is. <laughs> but I love it. <laughs> I love... <laughs> which is hilarious, especially when your it, yeah. opponent has more poverty than you. Yeah, you they're just, just sitting in poverty. You can really look down your nose at the person across the table. Yeah, it really brings out the kind of British snobbiness. That uh, they're stereotypically known for. You can also take out loans, which are an evil, horrible trap, just like in real life. Uh, I say that because I went for a loan-heavy strategy the last time we played, and it did not work. I, I took it out was a few great loans. until I had to pay them off. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and then you're yeah, it's it's no good when you have to pay off loans, especially when the interest rate is fifty <laughs> <laughs> percent. So know. I only played this the one time with you at PAX. I wonder if we played this game five or ten times, it would be so much about denying other people certain buildings. I think it could be, and I think it, if it did turn into that kind of game, it would be even better. Like, I think that would be a huge improvement on it. But as it is in the first couple of plays, just trying to figure out how to balance how much income you can squeeze out of the city while still being able to manage all the poverty and debt you're in is is really, really fun. The other cool thing it has is that tempo management. Yeah, you you collectively determine the speed of the game. Right. And and, uh, because you can choose to, to take buildings from the center tableau or you can draw from the draw pile. And it's when that draw pile is is gone that the game ends. So especially when we, we played in the late game, I was... First I was trying to push it to the end of the game. And then you changed your mind all of a sudden. Well, and then I had to time it so that I could run my city yes. and, and end it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was great, yeah. The other tension you have is that you want to put more buildings in your city to do more stuff, but each time you go wider... That's one more poverty, both that time when you run the city and every future time because it creates like a new foundation in your city that now your city is six cards wide. So every time you run it, you get six poverty instead of maybe four if you kept it more narrow. But you can execute six action cards instead of only four. Yeah, and I think going broad or going narrow, both are valid strategies depending on how you utilize your buildings, which is cool. And there's just some fun, like, thematic things of the best way to get rid of poverty is just to, like, throw people in prison. Oh, yeah. Prisons are a great poverty reduction tool in sewers and streetlights. It's really, really funny in its theming of how, like, yeah, it's bourgeoisie kind of like, it's kind of like it a is. dark humor a little bit, but yeah, yeah. Yeah, but highly enjoyable. That's London. Number 64 is a dudes on a map battle extravaganza with awesome special powers and giant creatures and no it is not blood rage instead it is the better version of blood rage that we call kemet it's a really really cool game it's this basic setup where you have a certain certain types of actions you can do and some little figures on the map and you're trying to take over certain points on the map to gain points but then there's this entire almost like tech tree system of upgrades that you're trying to manage and by the end of the game your army functions so much more differently than all the other armies on the board and then it has this cool map where everything is kind of equidistant like every major point on the map is equidistant to every other major point so everyone is within range it's not like due to the geography of the map these two people are going to battle at first. No, you can get anywhere with like four movement points, like literally anywhere from anywhere else. Last time I played, one of the other guys bought the plus one movement speed 
and then they bought the beetle which is another plus two movement speed for that army so they could just charge from their city anywhere on the map and it was terrifying that, that's my favorite memory of playing <laughs> this game you was can't get the away beetle. from the beetle yeah. and it just chases you down <laughs> Yeah, and then so if you get the thing that lets you go over walls too. You can just charge into someone's city. Yeah. Yeah, that's Which side note, the beetle and the other like what what are the those? The bird titans? flies over the wall. They're are called creatures. Creatures? They're it's... so satisfying. Oh, yeah. they're so cool. Army. And they're all unique. And so you're like, "Oh, I have this giant elephant and it has armor." Aha. And then the beetle just like blitzes past you and takes the shrine you were going for. Yeah, and in line with the geography of the map, it's a race to what seven points, eight points, eight points, eight, eight, eight or ten. Yeah, Sh- eight uh, or ten short points. Or long game. Yeah. And every time you win a battle that you oh. initiated on the attack, you get a point. You only get points for a winning attacking battles, so you're heavily incentivized to attack and then just have your whole army like disperse into prayer points and just like <laughs> evaporate and then respawn them back in your city. Yeah, so from, like, the very first turn, there's action, and then action doesn't stop. By the end of the game, sometimes it's a downer because you can kind of math out, like, okay, they're going to do this, and then this, and then this, and then this guy is going to win because turn order is so incredibly important. Right, because the initiative of who gets to attack the other person or who gets to move after someone else and take the shrine uncontested is hugely important, especially on the last turn. Because of that on the last turn, the, the it can get a little anticlimactic at the end, but it's like all climax the whole game anyway. <laughs> so like yeah. you're always doing something big and crazy and or gearing up to do something big the and crazy. The other thing that can happen is you, you can get in a situation where one person is so powerful, you just can't fight them. Like this last time I played, the one guy, an, a di- the different guy had the scorpion, which is plus two attack and plus two blood or something. Or no, maybe plus one blood damage. And then they also had the card that says, before combat starts, you kill two of the oh, enemies. Yeah. Oh, that's and, brutal. And plus one on attack. So they, And they had a bigger army. So they would come in with seven troops, the scorpion, and plus one attack. So they'd come in with a base of ten and wipe out two of yours before the battle even starts. So you had no chance. You can't fight them. There was this whole thing of like, wait for him to move somewhere or move out with exactly two troops so he can't win a battle. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and, and play around that. It, there's so many different combinations like that. And then the battle system itself is really clever because it's a simultaneous reveal. And maybe this is an example, Matt, of a simultaneous reveal that you actually do enjoy. Well, yes. I mean, to be fair, it's nothing like Dungeon Pets or Dungeon Lords. Lord. Dungeon Pets is auction, I believe. No, uh, no, no, no. I mean, this is good. Yeah, and how it works is everyone has the same hand of combat cards, and they have to discard one and then play one from their well, hand. Well, the same except for the upgrades that they may have bought. There are a couple. There are like two yeah, upgrades well, that'll give you an additional events. card. But you know the cards that they could potentially be playing, and they all have different attack and defense and how many troops you kill. And so there's a little bit of a bluffing game there in and trying you, and to you outwit. Can, and you can pay attention to what they've played and then time your attack so that you know they only that have two cards Mark left. has played his four attack and he only has two cards left, so it's safer to attack him now. Right, yeah, you got to watch what other people have discarded already. So it uh, prevents it from becoming this solitaire game because you care about what other people are doing. Absolutely, and uh, just great Ameritrashy fun. I love I, it. I love how fast it feels. This game, like, I don't think it's actually that fast. It's probably, what, like, an hour and a half? Two hour and a half, long. yeah. But it, it doesn't feel like it's that long. Because like, there's well, constant action. Right, and it, it, it's it's great. Anyway, that's Kemet, one of the best Ameritrashy fighting combat crazy. Don't buy Blood Rage, don't buy Rising Sun, buy this instead. Buy Kemet! Yes, absolutely. I guess there's some controversy with everyone else in the world, but not among us. Are there expansions to Kemet? I believe there are two now. Yeah, I know there's one that introduces a new tech tree, like a new whole color. And then I think there was a second one, but I don't remember what it does. Oh, the the second one makes it an, an all versus one game, right? Does it? I think that was Komet's expansion. I, I th- That's weird. Anyways, let's move on to number 63, and that is Kali Mala. I guess this is the list of games that I played in conventions in the last few months. A lot of them. A yeah. lot of them have been. And this is a very dry Euro game. Call back to our last podcast episode about dry games. 
about building stuff. I don't even remember what it was about. It was basically this is the one where the actions are in the nine three by three grid. Yeah, yeah. And then you score things in the order or whatever. Yeah, yeah. This was a cool game, and it will change so much because there are nine actions that you can take, and but you don't place on one action. You place between two of them on this three by three grid, and you get both of the ones you are touching. Right. But except for the center one, which stays the same, you shuffle and deal the other eight each game. So you have a different arrangement of actions each game. So maybe the marble and statue, which is a combo, are next to each other one time and you just like pound that spot because it's super efficient. But then there's no, you can't get wood to trade next to the center. So you just kind of abandon all wood production because it's over in the corner and super awkward to use. Yeah, and then it's got this weird follow thing where, like, you literally stack your action pieces. So whenever you take a spot that someone else has been on, you get to do those two things, but then they're below you, so they then get to do it again. And you can stack up to three in each spot. Yeah, and so you could do it where you, like, you get if you really want to take this one particular action combo, you go there, you get to do it once. You go there again next turn, and you get to do it twice. And then you go there again, and you get to do it three times. But then there was the like fourth a fourth time when yeah. someone goes on that spot, they kick out the bottom disc, and it shifts up to the scoring track, and you score the next scoring category. And so there, you score each type of resource. Right. And you score each of the like shipping locations and the unique buildings. So I think you're all merchants of genoa or venice or something yeah and something like you that are, you're shipping goods out to other cities to sell them but you can also donate them to help rebuild these cathedrals which give you points eventually yeah so it's this kind of area control thing because you're trying to end up with the most cubes in each of the different sectors but you have to really pay attention to what actions are next to each other and then and the when everything is going to yeah. be scored, because that's completely randomized at the beginning of the game also. Really clever system, I thought. Yeah, the, for sure. The one we played with, I think, was pretty generous with resources and such. I but think the guy one we... resource was in the corner, but the other, yeah. when we, it, it was so much harder to use that one. And the other two were in good spots. Yeah, but I mean, you can imagine a, a, a setup that was so much more stingy on resources, oh, yeah. and it would have radically change the game oh yeah oh. so game to game you have to come up with a different strategy because some actions will be twice as efficient as they were in the previous game yeah so that's super cool that's a newer game i think it's available in the u.s now when we played it back a few months ago i believe the guy who owned the game said he got it from essen and it hadn't been shipped out to the u.s yet so for once in my life i was a board game hipster and got to play that before its U.S. release, but I think it's actually out in the U.S. now. I think I saw it at a game store somewhere. This game sounds great, what you're describing. We should get it. It's the epitome of a dry game. Like, it is... Oh, yeah. It is literally pushing cubes. Like, that's a pejorative people use. Like, oh, you're just a, a cube pusher. This game's literally about pushing cubes. I mean, it's a few grains of sand from being Forbidden Desert. <laughs> wow. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can't add to that. I guess we're going to move on to the next game. Number 62, the next Star Wars game on my list, Star Wars Imperial Assault, which is effectively Descent, which we talked about in the last list, but Star Wars and just mechanically superior in a few very, very important ways. So it's a tactical mini skirmish game. It actually has a skirmish game in it, but like Descent also has a campaign it's a dice chucker. You're upgrading your characters. You follow kind of a loose It's a 1v story. All yeah, 1v all. One person's the Imperial. Everyone else is the Rebels. And just a fun time of rolling dice and trying to shoot stormtroopers and occasionally meeting up with heroes of the Star Wars universe. And I had a blast playing through the campaign like one and a half times. We haven't tried the skirmish game yet, but there's like a competitive tactical skirmish game rule set that you can play with out of the box and maybe someday we'll get to that i think it i've heard it's very very good and some people only play the skirmish game because they like it that much but i think for kind of a dice chucking dungeon crawler it's a great time and it's star wars it's star wars. yeah so so one the the mechanical changes from descent to this 
raise it from a bad game to an okay game. It is a dungeon crawler, but honestly, I I thought the Star Wars setting just worked better than the Descent. I mean, the the Descent setting was exactly what you expected from a dungeon crawler. It's a generic fantasy thing, yeah. Yeah, whereas this doesn't really feel like a dungeon crawler, even though it is. Well, I mean, okay, technically it's not really. There are no dungeons. You're on, like, a spaceship. It's a yeah. tactical minis game more so than a dungeon crawler. Right, I yeah. think you get thrown into a dungeon at one point, and then you have to escape the dungeon. So, But it's a space dungeon, so <laughs> does it really count? But Star Wars is so much more evocative as yeah, a, as a setting than I, the Descent I think, world. I think the 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 characters were were good, and the customizations that you can make as you unlock new things by winning missions. Yeah, it's still it's what, it's what you want out of uh, uh, one of these serial episodic crawlers. Sure, yeah, and it still has kind of severe balance issues like Descent did, but I think. There's a surprisingly high amount of strategy compared with Descent, and considering that everything is resolved using dice, that made it a pretty tight strategic experience that I enjoyed, and Star Wars is Star Wars in a blast. Does this have an option to fight against an app rather than having a evil mastermind? I think the app is out. I don't... I know they made one for Descent. Okay. And I think the one for Imperial Assault well, is now released. I, I, I had forgotten that they were making one for Descent. I'd be interested in playing again with that. One of my big criticisms of both of these games is I don't like the Overlord mechanic. There's some tension where it, it becomes too close to role-playing, but it's really not. I um, think that's an issue with how unbalanced some of the missions are, not sure. with the one VR. Yeah, if the missions were balanced and competitive every time that problem wouldn't exist yeah you're probably right yeah. but the missions just straight up aren't balanced so it is a problem yeah but i mean again kind of despite itself it's i think it's a really fun game to play and but then less so than rebellion <laughs> <laughs> i was waiting for that i was really waiting for that and then the last game on today's list number 61 is a really clever Days of Wonder game from, I believe, Bruno Cathala, who's one of the more famous designers out there in the world, and that is Five Tribes. Ah. Ah. What a ah. game. This, this game feels so unique. Yeah, it's cool. It's got this Moncala thing. The way you score points is kind of kind of your standard Euro, you know, set collection, a little bit of set collection, a little bit of just trying to get high value targets on the map. But the way you take actions is so cool because it's like a free form Moncala on a grid, you know, or like a forbidden desert style tile. Was it six by six or six by five grid? I think in, like yeah, in five tribes and you have to pick up all the little people in your spot and then drop them one by one and land on a spot. And then you get to activate the color that you dropped and get some kind of effect from that color, either collecting them or assassinating another meeple on the board or doing other various things. And then the key is that you want to be able to eliminate all the meeples from a space. And then you get to claim that the points from that space. And I think it's a fairly divisive game because it is so AP problematic. There, there can be so much analysis paralysis here. First of all, because of the bidding system for turn order, which frankly is the best turn order bidding system I've ever seen. It's really, really good. And then the fact that you can't really plan your turn of actually moving the meeples until your turn happens because someone else could just change everything. Yeah. they ch You change so much about the board when you take your turn that you have to kind of reevaluate from the beginning every time your, your turn comes around. That being said, it's genuinely a fascinating puzzle every single turn, just trying to squeeze out as many points as you can from the configuration yeah, on the it, board. It, it's a great balance of kind of that unique tactical decision of which group of me meeples do I do the Mancala thing, and where do I move them to, and what path do I take. And then what opportunities am I opening up for the next person yeah, who plays? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And you're balancing that against your wider strategy of 
I want to get mostly green meeples because I'm, I'm maximizing my points in that way or, or whatever. Yeah, a puzzly Euro that does the puzzle really well and uh, genuinely good time. It just feels different than any, any other game that I can yeah. think of. Yeah, there's nothing else I've played that's like that. Well, that's our list for today. The next installment of my top 100 games of all time numbers, this time numbers 80 through 61. Don't forget to check out the website at thethoughtfulgamer.com. Hit me up at social media on Twitter and on Facebook. And if you want to watch our normal podcast live, you can help us financially a little bit, just a dollar or two a month on the Patreon, and you can watch those live and have a great time listening to us banter and watching Matt become extremely crestfallen when the Penguins lose. I'm a very optimistic person. It's fine. I'm now a Vegas Golden Knights fan, and you're going to hear about it the next two <laughs> that weeks. Is the, At least. That is the quickest bandwagoning I have ever seen in my life. It's it's Penguins West, baby. <laughs> Honestly, the East turned out as bad as it could be. It's the Lightning versus the Caps. It is. Because yeah, I, I could get on board with the Bruins if the Pens were We could out, have had... But... Pittsburgh, or Bruins, Pitt, that, that was the best case scenario. I mean, I, I was going to game if that was going to be yeah. the case, but it's fine. This is a you know board what? game podcast. This is the year that Ovechkin can get his cup, finally. Let him have one. He's turned gray. He I'm editing a, all something. of this out. <laughs> anyway, watch the normal podcast. Go to patreon.com slash the thoughtful gamer. Guaranteed hockey content. Where's the cat, Mark? Oh, yeah, Amber, where's the cat? <laughs> one of one of Mark's guarantees is if you are on the pi- Patreon and watching us stream this, you will guaranteed see the cat every episode. The yes. The podcat. The podcat. Whoa. Whoa. <laughs> Whoa. That You're was welcome. amazing. Honestly, I think the cat is why most people watch the podcast. <laughs> I mean, it's fair. Oh, well, she is very happy. She's a very happy cat. She likes basking in the, her fame among our many many one viewers <laughs> so many anyway there's the cat for those listening to this i bet you're all so very confused and i delight in that there was definitely a cat here we are not lying yeah there was a cat it was, it's my cat it's amber's cat <laughs> it's amber's cat <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> and technically i got the cat but then i it's gave amber's it to cat amber. yeah i gave it to amber also the cat chose amber <laughs> to be her her favorite person it's true and finally if you like the podcast but don't want to support us financially you can go and rate us on itunes Woo! or do both or do both that'd make my day honestly that would actually we'll talk to you all again soon goodbye peace out go pens (laughs) 